Well, welcome everyone. We are here with the final AIM series of the semester. And I'm excited that we have Graziella Rufa who's gonna share with us her story and give some tips to our students who've joined us here tonight. We've got about 30 folks who are with us here. To start, like we do with these AIM series, we're going to begin with a message from Dean Devisagayam. And here's the Dean's brief welcome message. Welcome to the Alumni in Management series. This is a series of one-on-one -on -one conversations that's designed to bring in the expertise and experience of emergent leaders to our classrooms. We in the Leon Hess Business School believe that your learning outside the classroom is truly essential to supplement our learning inside the classroom. As you listen to the conversation this evening, focus in and relate it to your own experience, your own professional experience from jobs, from internships, and see what you can learn that would be of help to you right away, in the near future as you approach the job market, and in the distant future as you craft your own leadership path. My thanks to Professor Palazzolo for organizing this event. I must mention that uh, he's a proud alum of Monmouth himself. My thanks also to the alumni for bringing in their expertise and experience, sharing it with us so generously, and most of all, for the time and effort you're putting in to giving back something to our institution. Thank you. Finally, I thank each one of you for attending. I hope you learned something new today that you can apply beginning tomorrow. Enjoy. So we thank the Dean for those welcoming remarks. And one of the things that I love about the AIM series is that we actually have this set up so that Graziella will introduce herself through a video that she pre-recorded for us. So give us one moment and we will get Graziella's video up here and playing for you now. Hello, it's so nice to meet you all. My name is Graziella Rufa and I graduated from Monmouth University back in 2016, and I was there for four years. And I, I majored in marketing and minored in graphic design. I quickly made the transition from management to marketing after my sophomore year. And I was part of a lot of different clubs and, and work in organizations at Monmouth. One being Enactus, which was an entrepreneur organization that I was a president of. And Janeth Merkel was my advisor, who is a dear friend and also my boss at the business dean school, which I worked with, who I worked with at Federal Work Study. Um, so on top of Federal Work Study and refereeing at night, I had my hands full with Alpha Kappa Psi as well which was a co-ed business fraternity and unfortunately no longer exists, but that was a huge part of my life. And we had a great relationship with the business council with mainly another one of my advisors, Richard Riccardi, who um, helped me a lot throughout my, my career and my growth. And on top of that, I was also part of club soccer and Croquet Club, which which uh, Rich was also the advisor of, and um, and that really helped, and and Actis helped really influence the internships that I received my junior senior year. So I am originally from from Raritan, New Jersey, and it's a small town right next to Bridgewater. And I graduated from Bridgewater Raritan High School with over eight hundred kids in my class. I am a first-generation American, so as you can imagine, it was a big deal going to private school like Monmouth University. Um, I don't regret it for a second, and 
it's really paved the way to my career and the relationships that I built into pharmaceutical advertising, which is what I do now. And just know that we will talk through a lot more of my journey very soon. And I will tell you all of the highs and lows of my my career path and what set me up for success. And just know that the alumni like myself are here to help guide you and mentor you and ask any of those questions that you have that can be a little scary at first when you're first starting your career. So I will speak to you all very soon and we'll chat in a bit. There you go. I mean, the introduction's done. And I want to talk about all of that. I want to dig into everything you said there in that video for us, Graziella. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you for being here with us tonight. Um, no problem. You, you, you just watched your you just watched your, your intro video. Is there anything you want to add to it before we before we start our, our conversation? Sure. I think the last time I fully watched myself was in my communications class my senior year. So that's It's always a little nauseating when you're replaying yourself, uh, even in the world of, you know, Instagram and Facebook Live now. So I think I'll add additional context as as we go through my journey. I know, Joe, you sent the uh, journey of how I started and what year I graduated, even where my parents came from, and all the way up until where I'm working at the moment. Yes, and and I'm going to share that as well in a moment here. do you want to do you want to talk a little bit about what it's like being first generation American? Let's start there and let's 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 start the journey at that point. <laughs> sure. So uh, as I think, you know, growing up, there's always family around, which is a blessing. And I think, you know, my my dad. So both my parents came from Italy and they instilled the work ethic as as you all no, I mean, immigrant parents have one of the hardest work ethics that I know. And, um, and you always want to give back to your parents and what they gave you. So making sure that you do well in your career and in school and at work um, and just being a good person and a genuine, honest person and having those morals and values at work kind of translates and makes you feel like you're a part of something bigger. But but definitely um, having that ingrained in your mind at a young age, I think, is, is important as, you're, as you continue to have the determination you need to land the job that you want. I agree. I agree. So tell us a little bit about what it's like coming from that type of family where your, your parents are born in Italy, they come to this country, and now they've got a daughter who's going to go to college. I mean, did it, what is college then? What is the American college system like for them? I think even you know, being, I mean, my parents always raised me as, as being a kind person. So they tend to be a little, you know, illiterate or <laughs> uh, technology. They're not too savvy in that field, but it's, I mean, it's, it's just a growing pain that you, you work on. So applying for schools and having federal work study, I think that's, you understand how to be a self-manager and an independent. And I think I've always done what it takes and you're your own boss and your own manager, ultimately at the end of the day. And if you want something to happen, you either ask for it or you do it yourself or have the right advocates around you. And that's important to learn at an early age because nothing will be handed to you unless you unless you work for it. That is the truth. And 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 I love the idea of, you know, some folks not being tech savvy and so that not being part of the the culture you're brought up in. Uh, my my father's side of my family also comes from Italy. And um, if you know, if my father were still with us and he saw the things we do with technology today, he would, it would be mind blowing, <laughs> mind blowing. You know, what do you mean you've got more than one screen? How, how do they make a screen so small? You know, I could just, I could see my father going wild. Um, <laughs> tell us a little bit about your time in high school, what you learned in high school that's still with you. And then let's let that lead into how you got to be a hawk here at Monmouth University. 
Sure, sure. So let's take a blast from the past for a minute in 2012. And in high school, so the activities and events and sports that I was a part of translated into my college experience. So um, being the president of Friends of Rachel, which was all about anti-bullying and being the president of peer mediation and also running track all four years and, and playing soccer and doing cross country on and flip-flopping between soccer and cross country, uh, that it, I was always doing something and I always had, I was always busy and uh, it's always good to you know, keep your mind busy and it's important to have those days to relax and, and decompress and, and um, ground yourself on what to do next. So understanding that, well, being in an Italian household and our heritage, we all love to be close to each other, which is why I had the option of going to Florida for cross country or going to uh, Monmouth, and that was 45 minutes away from my home. So the decision was easy for my parents and for myself after, and I'm sure you've all heard this a lot, is that you go to the campus, you fall in love with it. I lived at the Bluffs for a couple of years too, and I knew that that would be my new home. And being younger, I think, Know, making sure you you have the right relationships and connections with friends and and making yourself involved. I mean, your orientation leaders are right. They they're always going to tell you to get involved and push yourself outside of your comfort zone. And if you're not going to do it in college, then you certainly won't push yourself in in the real world. That is the truth. That is the truth. Um, and and I wanna I wanna maybe go back a little bit and talk about being the president of the anti-bullying group, because I feel like there's a lot of connection to what we see um, in terms of extracurricular engagement for our students today, where uh, the professional world wants to see more engagement in these types of activities. So again, again, a, a blast to the, to, to, to the past. Let's, let's go back to, to high school when you were the president of that group. What are some of the things you learned way, way back when in leading organizations like that that still stick with you today? So I, I'll, I'll quote Friends of Rachel and also Peer Mediation. I had a lot of the advisors were across both of the clubs and they would always tell me when we were in our workshops, because we, we had a couple of days that were offsite at a nearby location where all the students that were part of the club came together and, and had training on how to be a peer mediator and also training on how to flag or indicate if someone's being bullied. And, and I think at the end of the day, when you're being hired, especially at the organization, the company I'm at called Click, the headquarters is in Toronto and, um, and they also have an office in, in Philly and New York. But out of all the places I've worked at, they put people first. And at the end of the day, um, it doesn't matter what your, qual it does matter your qualifications, but if you're not a kind person and you're not determined or passionate or um, or see the good in people or generous and compassionate, then they won't hire you. And and I think all of the buildup from high school and having the trainings and my advisors telling me like sometimes you can get in situations at work that aren't that are challenging, um, that aren't the prettiest and you might have a conflict over what we use as Teams or Zoom or through an email. And it's better to flag, like I said before, and notice, okay, most of the time, if something doesn't feel right and your gut is telling you that this is wrong, then it is. So if, if you feel uncomfortable or if your manager isn't treating you a certain way, um, I've had numerous managers that I think that's a different topic too, that uh, we didn't really sync up as well as I wanted to. And that's the number one reason why people leave is because they don't, they don't respect or get along with their manager. And uh, there's so many things from high school that translate into indicating um, and, and highlighting those red flags and knowing how to cope with it. And there's a process of of identifying it and also speaking to the right person and, 
And when you do find the right work, you also have training and onboarding and LinkedIn learning sessions where you can learn about how to report an issue. What if the issue is about your manager? Um, what are the steps you take in order to resolve it? So it's at all in all, it's better to be professional. And if something doesn't feel right, it's not right. Amazing that the style and scope of training that you get, even as far back as high school, does really carry with you through the college years and then into your professional career. So let's let's talk about the college years now. Um, mm -hmm. We, you know, at Monmouth, we call it first to fly. So you're the first to fly for your family, a first generation college student. Tell us a little bit about that. What's it what's it like being on our campus here with us at <laughs> Monmouth as a first generation college student? It's, it's great. I think a lot of my, a lot of my friends were also either on scholarship or the people that I became close with were from frontal work study where they had similar stories. And it's, it feels when you look back, I can't believe the four years was as short as it was. And um, just to give everyone some context too, is that my freshman year was Hurricane Sandy so we ended up being evacuated uh, for quite some time when I was there, but it's it feels great to have the degree and hang that up and and I mean a degree is a degree it it just depends on what you do with it and and I think without going to Monmouth I I would not I feel like I would have been lost in my career if I didn't have the relationships that I did. Good. Good. Well, I'm glad to hear that as a as, as someone who's here at the university. Hey, here at the university, tell us how you how you found your way to marketing. So, how did I find my way to marketing? I so I I actually wanted to be a graphic design major, and my right. parents talked me out of it, <laughs> and, <laughs> and they didn't really understand that uh, advertising is a whole field, and there's agencies that hire designers and UX designers, and uh, there's web developers and, and they, they had no idea or education on either of that. Everyone in my family, um, they were, they are working at the same industry for over 10 years. My mom has been at Santa Fe for over 30 years. My brother is at the same job at Merrill Lynch since he graduated college. So one being in marketing or advertising to begin with is a little foreign to them because they don't understand that okay if you do hop around a little bit I'm not saying every year but um, marketing has the flexibility in that creative aspect which I loved as well as um, the business planning and, and solution making and understanding strategic imperatives it's in that all of that encompasses what I do in advertising at the moment and marketing seemed the most appealing. I know I mentioned I was a management major, but that seemed a little too process oriented. Um, and marketing was, was best of both, was the best of both worlds. And you were able to, to also do graphic design as well. So, right. You know, right. Nice to have those options here at the university. Uh, also at the university in your introduction, you told us that you were involved in a lot of groups. I feel like I want to spend an hour talking about each group, but we can't do that. Um, I'd love to know more about your experiences with, let's start with Enactus. Tell us a little bit about the work you did there, how that helps inform you today. Enactus was mind-blowing. I think and all, if you look at the journey, you'll see that I worked at Ferrero and I actually got the job at Ferrero working for Nutella as an internship through Enactus. And Enactus, uh, Janeth Merkel was my advisor and we did a couple of projects. One project was we co-authored a book with Nancy Uslin, who is the the wife of the first Batman movie, the director, the director's wife of the first Batman movie. And, cool. and I think at the time I didn't realize how substantial that relationship was until after we co-authored and we worked with uh, a school, an elementary school in Montclair, where we would put in our volunteer hours, which is part of an actus and the fraternity as well. And we created the book. It was an alphabet book called 
I eat an egg with an elephant and uh, it is published and it's in, it's in Rwanda and I wasn't able to go on that trip. It's, it was delivered to over 3000 students at the Posadi school there. And the idea behind it was to use the letters as, as descriptions of what these, these village people would find in their backyard. So people in that area oftentimes found gorillas in their backyard. So if the letter G, we would have gorilla so they can easily identify um, with that word and understand the English language a little bit more. So we published those as one of our projects. And then we also created a business in the Philippines, which is my project that I did in my senior year as I was leaving and I wanted to make sure that the right people in the group and please feel free to speak up to if you are part of an actus and I would love to talk to you. Uh, but we have a small shop in the Philippines where we indicated a need or a problem, which is the first step in any business solution, solutioning process or ideation process. And that was women in that community weren't able to make a living. So we identified one of their strengths, which is what you often do as a manager is identify your employee's strength. And that was cooking and baking, which is why we created a, a shop where the woman could have their own business and uh, cook their own cook their own food and sell it to near my people in 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 that area in Manila. And and that is currently still going. And I have to ask Janeth exactly how many people work there at the moment since that was six years ago. But I know that the, the team after me, once I graduated, took that over. But we, Janeth and I both worked on that entire business plan from the very beginning, understanding demographically what their needs are and, and how it would be a sustainable project. So if you break up an actus, there's EN, which means entrepreneurial, and then ACT, which means action within the community. And US stands for the community portion of, of giving back to the community and making sure that there's a measurement plan um, and a strategic action. So if you really take that organization and put it to what I do at work, it's exactly that. So those projects and the biggest part and I would say an actus was the best organization I could have been a part of at Mammoth. is you present that final presentation or your case of how these projects went at a national competition. And I was lucky enough to go my freshman and, and senior year and my freshman and junior year. And while you're presenting these, you go, we went to Missouri, we went to um, we went to Ohio, to Cincinnati, Ohio, and we would meet the CEOs of Walmart, of BIC, of Ferrero, of J&J, of Hershey, of Unilever. And that's where I got exposure to at the fairs that they have during these competitions is submitting my resume, speaking to the HR people there and the talent acquisition. I still have some of the business cards where... <laughs> If something, God forbid, something happens, I have them on LinkedIn and a hard copy. And uh, that was so much fun. And what do you know? I placed my resume at the booth at Ferrero, spoke to the representative there. And when I was at Define Logic at an internship my senior year, I got a call to work there and I ended up leaving that internship to go to Ferrero, which happened to be 15 minutes away from my hometown. Amazing. Amazing. All of this comes from an extracurricular activity at the right. university. Amazing. Mm -hmm. um, that's one. That's one of the many things yeah. you did when you were an undergraduate. And I mean, you could you could fill a book with just that experience alone. Let's let's talk about a related experience where you were a member of Alpha Kappa Psi, which is a professional business fraternity, no longer a part of Monmouth University, but tell us about your experiences with AKSI. I met some of my best friends through that, through that co-ed business fraternity. And we, I think during the pledging process, some of that is still ingrained in my mind. And uh, I think we'll always be close. I was part of the Delta class and 
uh, now everyone's getting you know engaged and getting married and getting puppies and it's it's uh, it's strange to think that we used to you know share a dorm together and now we're adults in the real world and getting married but but I yes two of my best friends came from that organization and um, and I think everyone throughout that that business fraternity would say the same thing. I mean, we are a family, we're still a family and we've been through it all together. Uh, and again, when I talk about the discipline and the determination to, to find the right job that fits you, that came through AKSI as well, is putting in that work to graduate in the class and, and become a brother meant a lot. And for all of you that are in Greek life, you know how much time you put into it and you better be getting something out of it. So if, if you're a part of it, great that you're meeting people. Um, but what's most important is when you graduate that you're finding a career. And that's exactly what it did for me. It, it set me up for success. We have, uh, we have quite a bit of fraternity and sorority members here with us tonight. Mm -hmm. And we also, it looks like we have a, a, a quite a bit of student athletes with us here as well. So it's a similar mindset, a similar mentality. You know, I, I like to ask the folks who join us here in the AIM series to now tell us a little bit about what you do after college and how'd you get to where you are. But as you've been referencing, and I, I believe it was shared with the students, I'm going to share it now with everyone. You've got a pretty circuitous route from Monmouth <laughs> University to Click. So let me share this so the folks can see it. <laughs> it's not, it's not a, it's not a one stop here, one stop there. It's it's a pretty circuitous route. So let's let's talk a little bit. Um, let's talk a little bit about graduating from Monmouth. By the way, I also want to talk about all the other things you did at Monmouth. But you know, mm -hmm. let's want, want to move into the professional stuff first. Um, let's talk about your first professional uh, your first professional gig after you graduate. Sure, sure. So. I graduated in 2016, so that actually takes us to, I'm going to pivot quite a bit to New York City FC, and a passion of mine that I've been referencing is, is soccer, and I was contemplating, you know, I'm a marketing major, but I love the sports industry, so I ended up working for them part-time, which was my favorite part-time job I could have done. I would wake up at 5 a.m. in Long Branch at the Bluff Apartments my junior, my junior year, and I would uh, take the two-hour train ride to the city, come home at like 1.30 a.m. after a game or after working there, and then do the same thing the next morning. Uh, so that was more of a fun I guess, part-time job, but I realized again, which is a point of internships is to see what you like and don't like is, uh, it wasn't exactly the salary that I was looking for. Once I graduated after putting in all of the effort that I did those four years, to be completely honest, um, it, it was, it was tough. So I love the people that I worked with. I love the experience, but I'm so happy it was a part-time job. And I ended up applying for, you know, the ticket, being a ticket salesperson for the NBA, for the 76ers, for New York City FC, got the interviews, got the job for New York City FC, and I declined it because I ended up getting the offer at, at B&O, which um, as one of my internships, I also did door-to-door -door sales. So I ended up, uh, I mean, you really become fearless after that experience, but that taught me that why don't I just go into these, these companies and drop off my resume and see what happens. So during winter break, that's exactly what I did. I dropped off my resume, my resume at BNO, and that was my first official professional, um, professional experience at a small agency. But boy, is that is is that not the truth? That if you want to, you want to become fearless, go door to door and try and sell something. You encounter every everything you could ever <laughs> imagine. Um, before we before we move on from uh, New York City Football Club, I, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken, when you were there, they were still brand new. It's still a startup, essentially a startup club. And right. even though it was part time, take us inside what it's like working at such a big and yet still startup company. 
Sure. We, so I was part of the fan activation team. And uh, for those of you that follow soccer, Pirlo, who was on the Italian national team, he was also on Juventus. He was one of my favorite players and he was moving to New York City FC. So I applied the night before, got a call back the next day and they ended up hiring me. I don't think they realized how far away I was really from from the city, but that that didn't matter because I showed up and did the work. And uh, so what does fan activation mean? It means that you're spreading the word exactly as you said, and you're handing out flyers, you're handing out, you're handing out pamphlets or, or um, sports calendars. So I, I was already part of the, I was a referee at school and I was already part of kind of that sports side. And it was very similar to doing that, ex- except you're advertising for the team and you're interacting with younger players and you're going to camps in Flushing Park and, and taking pictures for them and handing out free gear for New York City FC. Then the other part of the job is going to the games at Yankee Stadium because it is the smallest regulation size for a soccer field. And we would have the games there. I would be next to the players, have them sign the ball, and then they would kick the ball to the stands. Uh, So it was a very, very big organization, but I can easily say that I put my my stamp of, I guess, a Rufa name because you weren't allowed to get the players' signatures. And that day at the match, I actually asked Pirlo to sign my shirt. And no one told us as when we were working or as part of my training that we weren't allowed to. So my, my coworkers afterwards were like, Oh my gosh, I can't believe you got a signature. Like, how did you do that? I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> he was right next to me. Of course I'm going to ask. I mean, I was shaking and nervous, <laughs> but, but he ended up doing it and it was fine. But, uh, but I mean, I still have his shirt hanging and, and um, that was, a surreal moment at at that age. I love it. Going for it. Right. Why not? Mm. Good for you. Good for you. So from, from the New York city football club, we're now going on to BNO. Tell us a little bit about what you did with BNO. You were there for about a year or two. Tell us a little bit about what you did there and maybe some of the things that stick with you uh, as you then move on to, to truth well told. Sure. So at b and before my jump to McCann, which, which their philosophy was the truth well told, is b and was a small 50-person agency. So I, I got my first glimpse of agency life, which, um, which was at that small organization. And that was five minutes away from my house. And what better place to, to be working than commuting, having a five-minute commute. I think some of the pain points, which along that journey or or your experience was, um, and red flags throughout your career that I wish I knew ahead of time is because they were so small, the HR person was also the manager. So, um, that's the first red flag is when you have someone that is doing dual roles and you're, she was a manager and my manager, um, that was not okay, which I later on realized that there are larger organizations that have more resources where you do have a legitimate HR department. And uh, they were great people. I learned everything about engagement strategy and strategy there, and I was the front desk. So here I was doing a million and one things in college, and I was, you know, client services and answering phone calls and believe it or not, cleaning the kitchens as a college grad. And even though I learned a ton, um, another pain point in learning experience was that they promised a job for me when I returned from a trip from Italy, since it was my graduation and my manager who proved me coming. When I came back, um, it's common in agencies that you can have layoffs. So they overpromised a position that uh, didn't really exist or they didn't put in the effort to create that position, even though when they first hired me, they actually created a position for me because they liked me so much. 
um, but they guaranteed a position in strategy and that didn't happen. And then I realized, I quickly realized that they, even though the business said they were doing well, they actually weren't because um, a lot of people got laid off, including me. So it was an internship, um, but they, they ended my internship and that was a scary experience at first because I didn't understand what layoffs were and how that operated. And I understood that at a, at a young age. So learning lessons of making sure you have a legitimate HR department and the right manager to guide you and support you to getting into a business that has sustainability and um, a proper growth trajectory that you're looking for. That way you don't come and leave sooner than you think. And then Three, also understanding when people are over-promising you and having things written in an email so that you have a paper trail of history. It's like I want to take each one of these points and turn them into a one-hour conversation with the students because they're all so critically important. I mean, it's, it's so important that, that you become aware of these things. And, and you, even, you even referenced in your, uh, in, in your introductory video, like, hey, the alumni are here to help you. This is the kind of help you can get from alumni to give you this type of perspective. I mean, how is it, how is a student graduating from any university, let alone ours, supposed to know to look for those types of things, right? So thank you for sharing that with the students. I'm thanking you on there. Um, up, up next is McCann. So mm -hmm. as, 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 the, uh, as the professional route continues to work its way towards click, we're stopping at McCann Health. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the exit from BNO and the entrance into McCann. Sure. So, and I'll talk about the struggles of, I think, being laid off so early on. I think you're frustrated, you're, you're angry, you're kind of relieved at the same time because I was thinking about leaving too. Um, I wasn't happy where I was, but I loved the people I worked with. And that was the hard part. Um, so it ended at the right time because my going to McCann, it's true. You have to know someone in order to get into the next place. And I was still early, early on in my career that I didn't have the credentials yet for something like an associate strategic planner that I was looking for. Um, so it was important to know people in the industry and my brother's best friend's girlfriend worked at McCann. And as I was doing my search, I reached out to Chris, my brother, actually Chris Adcock is a former alumni too of, of Mammoth. And he mentioned McCann and I interviewed for a project coordinator, which is kind of the, the easiest entry level position you can get. And McCann was a whirlwind. They are, um, if any of you have seen Mad Men, they are you know, as big and bold as people know they are. If you mention McCann to any advertiser, they'll be, they'll, they'll check that off your list and you'll automatically be qualified for any other advertising job after that. But they, uh, they taught me so much. I think I was there for three years and what's uncommon is that being in project management, you usually continue the trajectory to an account role, a client services role where you're face-to-face -face with, where you're maintaining those client relationships basically, or you go into a project manager role where you're still managing the 30 plus projects that you have on the brand. And I was on HIV, so it was Trimec and TibiK as well as diabetes, which was uh, Tricebo. Um, and Ozempic. So if some of you have seen the commercial where it goes, oh, 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 Ozempic. That was a brand that we worked on. But, <laughs> but aside from diabetes and HIV, that was my first glimpse into what it takes to get a product rolled out after it's approved from the FDA. So there's an entire process and phase approach from the FDA until a, a product reaches or goes live in the market. Um, so we touched printed materials, digital assets, labels on prescriptions that you see, and being in project management as a coordinator, you understand that entire process and you're working with the entire team. So 
being the hub of the team and having that responsibility, I had foresight into um, a lot of terminology and lexicon that you should know if you're in advertising. And that was great, but it wasn't enough for what I was doing. And I wanted to get into brand strategy, which is what they call it. So there's project management, there's brand strategy, which is engagement and traditional brand strat. Then you have editors and creatives and graphic designers and copywriters and art directors. So that just gives you a picture of who exactly is working on your team. But I, when I was working in project management, I was working closely with the brand strategists and I told myself, I want to do what they're doing. And I relentlessly did extra work. I worked over time and ended up doing some small projects for people that were in strategy. And after some time, even though my manager didn't want me to leave because I was so good at what I did, I, I went into strategy and, and um, actually now where I work at Click, some of the strategists that were giving me that extra work now work at Click. So you come full circle in your career after even five years later where I'm working with the same person. And again, you never want to burn any bridges because you never know who you'll interact with. And, and advertising is such a small community, whether you're in consumer advertising, working on TikTok or, or uh, Unilever or the consumer food industry, or if you're in pharmaceuticals. So it's, it's a very tight community. Everyone knows each other. And when you've been in the business for over six years, uh, you're bound to work with the same people again. And, and yeah, so McCann was a three-year process, but I worked my way into strategy and I ended up losing some managers. Um, again, I learned the hard way of sustaining a manager and having the right advocates for myself, which took a little bit longer, but when I did find the right manager, which was at McCann Health, New Jersey, um, I, I loved it, but we actually lost the business when I became an engagement strategist. So I went from brand strategy to engagement. Um, and another learning lesson in, in, in advertising is sometimes if you win business where there's something called a request for a proposal, where if you pitch a business and you win it, sometimes you lose a business. And that's what happened to the brand that I was going on. But um, but yeah, I, I ended up working at McCann. The first place I worked at was called Echo. Second place I worked at, at McCann was called McCann of New Jersey. Then they merged, which you know, acquisitions and merging happens all the time. So another point that I'll make at McCann is that when you do have a merge or an acquisition happen, just know that the culture drastically shifts. So sometimes you might not have uh, the same people that you work with or different senior leadership. So if you know that you're getting hired to a company and you're not getting along with that senior leadership department, or you see something fishy or shady that senior leadership is doing, like I said before, if something doesn't feel right, chances are it's not right. So if you feel uncomfortable or if, if you see some red flags happening from senior management, then, then start thinking, you know, what your other options are. Yeah. The, and, and these are all points that are, that are backed by research as well. Um, if, if, if it feels like something is going wrong and you get the sense something is going wrong and you, you're seeing red flags, that's a warning. That's a warning. You know, heed the warning. Um, so again, I could, we, we could talk about any of these points here for the next hour. Uh, what is interesting to me is as, as you're telling your story, there are these common threads that move themselves even from pre-Mammoth, but from Mammoth all the way through your career, things like um, engaging with uh, your, your, your employer in a certain way and learning how um, to manage systems and, and understanding how things actually work in the professional world. And, you know, say it again for the folks in the back that this is a small world. 
So the mm -hmm. people you work with in your first job, maybe the people you see in your fifth job, and then maybe the people that you have, you know, uh, after after uh, work drinks with in your third job, you know, you're, you're, you're going to it's, it's a small world. So I'm, I'm very appreciative that that you brought that up. And and from from McCann, we now go to Wonder Thompson Health uh, for for a short stint there before we get to click. So why don't why don't you tell us about the move then to Wonder Thompson Health? Sure. So Wonderman Thompson Health, if, if you all Google it at the moment, you're, you'll likely see the consumer big WPP. So WPP and McCann are kind of arch enemies and they're rivals. But I, uh, when you get into the world of advertising, there's, uh, there's WPP, there's McCann, there's Ogilvy, there's um, Area 23, which is all consolidated to one place. But um, there are different people that you end up working for that have different cultures and different processes. So WPP, I made the jump because, uh, one, I know that I deserve more money <laughs> and which is sometimes a reality of what you're in. And two, I was looking for the support and the guidance from a true manager, which is something I lacked in my previous roles. And as I was interviewing, I met my manager, Maddie, who hired me. And it was a very small department. It was for the engagement department. And she's actually my manager now. So wow. she recruited me for the job I click. And Wonderman Thompson was, was great. I think I, I found my voice early on. Um, if you, unfortunately, in advertising, if you don't have the expertise or the guidance and people will often you know chew you up and spit you out and and understand that you know if you're not needed then sorry you're not going to be put in this project but you you really have to understand your strengths and how to work with people and uh, that comes with time but i was owning a lot of work so at mccann Oftentimes, my ideas were in the appendix of a client presentation, even though I was still presenting to the client and flying out to the client in Indianapolis for Lily, which I loved them. Um, there were certain accounts that I didn't have as much of a voice, which is why I wanted to be the owner and leader of my own ideas and have them be at the forefront. And that's exactly what happened, except when they realized that I had that capability, I was put on everything. And I had so much work to do for one person. And I didn't realize when I was there and a lot of colleagues are reaching out now, they're like, you're not going to understand how much you were really doing and how underpaid you were until you leave. But at the time, um, I had really great relationships with the internal team members and my boss we would have conversations about, okay, let's talk about goal setting, which is usually, it should be one of the first, it should be an interview question when you're getting hired at a job is uh, talking about, okay, what are your promotional cycles? And these are some of my goals and how do I get there? Because sometimes promotional cycles only happen once a year when really you want them to happen twice a year instead of waiting six months to get that title, even though you're doing the work for it already. Um, but at, at Wonderman Thompson, I was on four brands. So I was on prostate cancer, rare disease, um, and two vaccine brands for Pfizer. And so, yeah, so being in COVID and having Pfizer as a main client, uh, they are the pharma giants as they should be. Yeah, yeah. And it was, it was so much fun working on vaccines, but, but yeah, I can, if anyone is interested, I can also give you a, a, a backgrounder on exactly what pharma lingo is and, and the disease states that I worked on too. So what happened at Wonderman Thompson is that uh, I was doing a lot of work, didn't have as much support as I wanted. People were leaving and during COVID, people really left their industry, especially in as a strategist. There, the market is incredibly hot right now. So people were leaving and some what we call boomeranging were coming back. And 
Uh, and I, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I realized what my self-worth was and I have a lot of experience on different disease states and I knew I deserved more. And that's why I, I ended up leaving. And when you leave, it's also not that easy. Um, but in advertising, you have to not only interview with numerous people, but you have to have a case and present a case study and put work behind that. So I was actually doing my own work and doing the work for the case at the same time during the interview process. And, and it was worth it because now I'm working with my former manager. Um, and the reason why it was such a um, tumultuous journey at Wonderman Thompson Health is because I went through three managers in less than a year. Oh my gosh. Um, and Maddie was my first manager and I loved her. And I thought that she would be my manager my whole time there, but she left after four months. Oh. And the second manager I had, our styles didn't match up. He was much more fitted for the client side. Uh, and, and I ended up managing myself, which you never want that to happen because you're not growing. It, it's, it's interesting that, that you can observe this even relatively early in your career when it's becomes pretty obvious. This is a good takeaway for the students. It becomes pretty obvious at some point in your career where you say, you know what, the management here is not working and it's not working for me and for my growth as a professional. And, and so sometimes you have to make a move and you made another move to click, which is where you are now. So, mm -hmm. so bring us inside click. Sure. If you heard some pings before, it's probably because it was a project manager pinging me about the project. <laughs> so yes, work does happen in agency life. If any of you want to get into it, it's not a nine to five job, uh, but you, you still work extra hours. I can easily say though, that I have the right support. I'm working with a manager that I know and trust and uh, we get along synergistically and, and she pushes me and challenges me. So a few things that I was looking for at Click is that I needed a challenge and I needed the support and the right expertise. And that's exactly the void that they fill. Mm -hmm. And when they say that they put people first, they actually put people first. Like, for example, when I first got hired, they sent me cookies. Then for my birthday, they sent me edible arrangements. Oh. Then during the Halloween party, they have, because agency life is known to be like, you can have drinks on the job. You can, it's very open because you have creative minds that need the stimulation, um, but you, there's no pressure into actually doing that or not. Um, but because you work long hours, they compensate you by having free snacks, like the best snacks I've ever had at work or free cupcakes by Melissa, or giving out everyone got a free TV last year who worked at Click for wow. Christmas, a free smart TV. And wow. they really know how to take care of their employees. It is a very different process than what I'm used to. But so far, I've been here for a little over a month. And I do, I absolutely love it because I'm being taken care of and I, uh, I'm used to doing a lot more work, but they, it's been a slow progression and so onboarding, which is exactly what I needed. And I'm not working on four brands. I'm only working on two at the moment. And, uh, and it's, and it's great. I think there's so many people to meet. And another piece of advice so far that I'm learning is that, you know, over communication is key. Like I learned that early on. And if you have the time to do anything at work, even if you have a spare five minutes, you can look up. I mean, I'm a strategist, so I am constantly understanding the day-to-day -day trends in pharma. And I have like six or so subscriptions that I have populated on my phone. So I haven't been on Instagram and I think I haven't scrolled through Instagram for more than five minutes in like three weeks. Cause all I do is look at my Google news feed for work. Yeah. And I mean, priorities change when you graduate. It's, it's learning more about your industry and how to grow in it um, and setting those goals. So right now I'm a senior activation strategist, which means senior engagement strategist. The next move after is in most industries, it's an associate director here. It's just a director. Um, and then it's a VP and then it's an EVP. So 
Uh, so hopefully in the next year, if everything goes well, I'll be a director and, and it's exciting, but, but so far so good with everything. Well, it sounds like you're, you're, you're well on your way. And, and again, another, another great point when you graduate priorities change, it, it becomes less about social media clout with likes and, and favorites and more about professional clout and making sure people know your name and the quality of your work. Um, so let me let me ask you a couple of questions. Many of these are generated by by the students um, leading into this. So things like, are sure. there any are there any classes or any professors that stand out to you as formative in in your Mammoth experience? Yes. So Rosenberg for one, <laughs> and I think that was that was a very fun class. Um, I wish that I. I think it was my senior year. It was either a 400 level class, but I believe it was, it was a strategy class. It was my first ever strategy class that I took. And we did a case on Amazon and I loved that class. And I think um, doing the cases and forgive me, I wish I'm, I wish I remembered who my teacher was. Um, but I think any class that would give me a case on real world experiences or what's currently happening with um, with global giants and industry leads, not just Elon Musk or, or Jeff Bezos, but anything you can learn in the industry to prepare you and, and have that mentality for, it's, it's very applicable to what I do because we, are problem solvers and we give solutions to the client. And even though it's in a pharma lens, it still could be applied to any consumer advertising. Cases are a, are a great way to learn. And, and I know many students love them. So glad to hear that, that you enjoy them too. Nothing better than learning about the real professional world from real cases, right? Yes. Um, and Skiba. I cannot forget about Skiba. I think she loved us presenting in class and that I think we would we would often do a lot of group work. So um, as much as you don't like it, it is instrumental in working with different people and different minds and collaborating to work on an output because that that's not going to unless you're picking a field that's very independent, like data science or something. But it, you will likely be working on a team. Yeah. Excellent, excellent takeaway. It reminds me when I was in graduate school, um, we had a lot of teamwork assignments and uh, I was put on a team one time to do this review of a housing project here in Monmouth County. And I remember rolling my eyes thinking, oh, I got to work on this team. Well, wouldn't you know that the person on that team I was with, I have now worked with for 15 years and we've become great friends in our professional lives. So teamwork is good, folks. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Teamwork is good. Another <laughs> question from the students about, um, sure. and again, understand that uh, looking at the list here, most of these students are going to graduate in either in the next couple of weeks or in about six months from now. Mm -hmm. um, what are they walking into in the business world? Uh, what, mm -hmm. what, what's the professional world look like for these students who are just on the cusp of graduation? Sure. So I think actually one thing I'll, I'll note um, there's one, when I was working on Define Logic, which was an internship, I, okay, when they say, you know, look the part, they, they mean it. So agency life is very lax and you can wear casual clothes. I think now everything is remote and uh, you can actually push for that case to be working remotely when you graduate, um, which is a huge benefit to you and just work-life balance. But um, I can go to work on video, right? And I still, I live in Edgewater, so I, I work in the city, but I can meet up with my colleagues whenever. And, um, and you should look the part, um, unless I, I think you need to mimic what other people are wearing too. But if, if you look good, you feel good. I think that's a small aspect of, of everything, but what you can expect is no, just bring your A game. I think if there's a lot of athletes in the room, have that competitive nature, uh, be respectful, always at the end of the day, be professional, be kind, and, and don't be afraid to push the envelope because that's what employees are looking for. 
You're always in competition. It's just a different form once you graduate. Mm-hmm. Once you graduate, and then and then maybe maybe as a as, as a summation here, if you have any advice for the undergraduates, uh, not just not just on the professional world, but on being students, you know, as they're as they're winding down their 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 undergraduate careers and getting ready to get out there in the professional world, many maybe just some some parting advice for the students before we before we end. Sure, I think a couple of takeaways that I mentioned. Um, identifying the red flags and uh, really getting to know the people that you're working with is is important. Like during the interview process, if if you know that you're doing a group interview and you don't have the names of those people, get the names from the recruiter or the HR person, stalk them on LinkedIn, send them a message, like anything you could do to stand out from the crowd. I think it's even more competitive. Now, when I was first looking, it was so tough. I mean, of course I got denied and I I was applying for everything under the sun in marketing uh, from Chanel to to working at Kind to even working at Ferrero to work. I was denied from Unilever at least five times. And yet the people that I knew that worked there, uh, I had better credentials than they did. So you will find people where you're like, how did they get the job? I can't believe it. Like I, my resume is so much better than them and their LinkedIn is horrible. It's, you, it's hard to compare yourself, but don't stay optimistic. I mean, continue to stay positive and stay optimistic and don't discourage yourself by comparing yourself to other people. Just focus on, on your positives and your strengths and use the resources that you have at Monmouth to make sure your resume is buttoned up, send your resume to other people to gut check it and cross check it and spell check it. Um, and send in those, get premium, get a premium subscription. That's what I did at first and send those one-off messages because chances are it's a statistics game and one out of 10 will, or one out of 20 will respond. Great advice. Great advice. Persistence, resilience, utilizing the resources around you. Thank you, Graziella, for joining us here tonight. Thank you for sharing your experience and these great words of wisdom with our students. Uh, I think your story gives a great example of how sometimes postgraduate life is a little bit of a circuitous route, but if you stick to those things that you care about, you stick to those professional ideals that you want to achieve, You'll get there. You'll get there and continue to to be successful just like you are. So thank you again for joining us. Of course, no problem. And I will speak to you very soon, Joe. Great. Thanks. (laughs) Take care, everyone. Good night. Bye, everyone.